2,000 miles away from the trench stalemate in France, another kind of war was being fought in the desert wastes and river valleys of the Middle East. An old-fashioned war, a war of small armies and large spaces where mobility and maneuver still counted, where success or failure depended not on millions of men, not on the massed products of industry, but on the personality and leadership of generals, where cavalry was not an out-of-date spectator of vast killing matches, but the vital instrument of fast-moving offensives. Where rivers were the lifelines of the armies, as they had been in the eastern campaigns of Alexander the Great and Napoleon Bonaparte. This region was the bridge between Europe and the East, between the East and Africa. In the rich soil of its river valleys, the Nile, the Tigris, the Euphrates, human civilization had been born. Down the centuries, tide after tide of conquest had flowed over the Middle East. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, and the Turks. Under Turkish rule, life stagnated. Poverty and disease afflicted the people. The 19th century brought a stirring of ancient memories of nationhood to the Arabs. Men prophesied a free and united Arabia, rid of alien Turkish rule. In 1883, a French traveler noted, Everywhere I came upon the same abiding and universal sentiment, hatred of the Turks. The notion of concerted action to throw off the detested yoke is gradually shaping itself. An Arab movement, newly arisen, is looming in the distance, and a race hitherto downtrodden will presently claim its due place in the destinies of Islam. Towards the end of the 19th century, another race was reviving memories of nationhood, the Jews. They had scattered across the globe after the Roman Emperor Titus had captured Jerusalem in AD 70. Now there was a movement to bring the Jewish race home again and build in Palestine a new Jewish state. The Jews began to return. The subject races of the Middle East were stirring against the bonds of the senile Turkish Empire, but the Turks still ruled over the crossroads of the world, collision point of the imperial ambitions of the European powers. The Middle East, Egypt and the Persian Gulf, was the key to the British hold on her Indian Empire. To keep the Middle East safe from France, Nelson had sunk Napoleon's fleet at the Battle of the Nile. To keep it safe from Russia, Britain had fought the Crimean War. Since its opening in 1869, the Suez Canal had become the direct route linking Britain to India and Australia and New Zealand. And since 1882, the British had been the paramount power in Egypt. The early years of the 20th century had added another reason for British concern about the Middle East. In 1908, oil had been discovered in Persia, not far from the head of the Persian Gulf. In the new age of aircraft and motor transport, oil was becoming vital for Britain. The navy, too, was changing over from coal to oil. Unlike coal, which lay safe under British fields, this new fuel was in lands that might be menaced by hostile powers. From London and from Delhi, the British continued to keep watch on the Middle East. The eyes of the German Empire were also fixed on the head of the Persian Gulf. Through the Balkans, through Turkey itself, 
and across the sands of Mesopotamia, there lay Germany's road to the east, a road for her busy salesmen and industrialists. The Berlin to Baghdad Railway. By 1914, all but 400 miles had been completed. Germany's interest in the Middle East had been proclaimed by the Kaiser's state visit to Turkey and the Holy Land in 1898. His Majesty the Sultan and the 300 million Muslims who revere him as Caliph may rest assured that they will always have a friend in the German Emperor. When the Kaiser visited Turkey again, 19 years later, the war between the nations of Europe had engulfed Turks and Arabs and Jews and Egyptians alike. But he had redeemed his promise. In 1914, Germany gave Turkey the warships Goeben and Breslau to replace two Turkish ships being built in British yards and seized for the Royal Navy. Britain's act of seizure and Germany's gesture of friendship pulled Turkey from neutrality into war. In Constantinople, the crowds were in holiday mood. But the Kaiser saw them, and all their fellow Muslims everywhere, as a means of destroying Britain's Indian Empire, that empire which tormented him with envy. We must inflame the whole Mohammedan world to frantic rebellion against this detestable, treacherous, conscienceless nation of shopkeepers. For if we are to bleed to death, England shall at all events lose India. Turkey went to war with a German-trained, German-equipped and German-advised army, recruited from some of the toughest fighting stock in the world. Which way would the Turks march? Across the Sinai Desert to the Suez Canal? Down the Tigris and Euphrates to the oil fields of Persia? For the British, the loss of either would have been a catastrophe. In London and Delhi, orders were given. Convoys of troops sailed to parry the Turkish threat. Indians and Australians and New Zealanders to Egypt, British and Indians to the Persian Gulf. The expedition from India landed at the head of the Gulf and marched on to capture Basra, the Turkish port where the great rivers Tigris and Euphrates flowed sluggishly to the sea. The army discovered Mesopotamia, where even the towns were crumbling heaps of mud houses. An Arab proverb said, When Allah had made hell, he found it not bad enough. So he made Mesopotamia and added flies. Gradually, a primitive base was built up amid the palm groves of Basra. More troops arrived to share the flies and the dysentery. The oil fields were safe. There seemed nothing more for the army to do. But its new commander, Lieutenant General Sir John Nixon, was not a man to rest on the defensive. General Nixon had a well-earned reputation for dash. And he himself was under the impression that he had been selected for command largely on account of this particular characteristic. Nixon dispatched a British and Indian force northwestwards to find and defeat the Turks. Through the spring floods of 1915, between and along the great rivers, the army labored slowly forward towards Baghdad. In country where an army must provide for itself, everything had to be improvised. Transport, medical care, hospitals. It was the rainy season when the rivers were in flood. For transport, the British used small native boats called bellums. Gunboats protected the advance, just as they had protected Kitchener's advance up the Nile in 1898. But unlike Kitchener, the British were not building a railway line behind them. By June, the army was at Amman. 